In this video, I'm going to walk you through an example of a literature review from a dissertation that earned full distinction. I'm also going to take you through our tried and tested literature review template step by step so that you have all the tools you need to write a winning literature review. So let's get started. Hey, Derek here from Grad Coach. If you're new to the channel, the Grad Coach channel is where we discuss all things research related so that you can approach your dissertation, thesis, or research project with confidence and competence. This particular video is based on an extract from our popular online course, Literature Review Bootcamp. If you're new to formal academic research and you're trying to find your feet with the literature review, you'll definitely want to check that out. To say thanks for watching this video, we've included a special offer and you can find the link to that in the description below this video. As I mentioned in this video, we're going to be looking at a sample literature review as well as our own tried and tested literature review template. You can access that using the link in the description. All of that is completely free. In terms of the structure of this video, we're going to first look at the literature review templates so that we can unpack exactly what needs to go into a literature review. And then we'll look at the sample literature review so that you can see how this all plays out in an actual dissertation. So let's jump into it. It's worth mentioning upfront that every university and by extension, every degree program will have slightly different expectations in terms of what goes into the literature review and what the literature review looks like. Some will expect a little bit more focus in certain areas. Some will expect a slightly different structure. And so it's important to recognize this. And what it means in practical terms is that you need to pay very, very close attention to any briefing documents, any samples, any templates that your university has provided you with and follow those as closely as possible. It's also important to note that in this video, we are looking at a literature review chapter within a dissertation or thesis or full size research project. What that means is that if you're writing a literature review as a standalone item, say as part of a piece of coursework, then this might be slightly different from what's expected there. Nevertheless, the core function and, and the core components should still be much the same. And so you will still get a lot of value from this video. For our purposes, we'll be working on a five part structure or five component structure for a literature review. These five components consist of one, the introduction, two, the foundation of theory or theoretical framework, three, the empirical research, four, the research gap, and five, the conclusion. This five part structure is pretty standard. It's tried and tested. And so we'll be looking at that structure throughout both the template and the actual literature review. So let's get started by looking at the literature review template. All right, so yeah, we have the literature review template. As I mentioned, you can access this template for free on the Grad Coach blog and we'll include a link below this video. So let's skim past the first page, which is just providing some additional free resources and get to the introduction section. So as with any chapter within a dissertation or thesis or full size research project, you'll need to introduce the chapter and just provide a quick overview of what the chapter is about. And specifically with the literature review chapter, it's useful to also mention or just remind the reader of your topic and your research aims because that sets the scene for the chapter. So you don't want to burn too much word count here. This is not where you're going to earn marks. This is just a, a bit of a, a UX enhancement to help the reader understand what's coming up and understand how things might be laid out where you're going to earn the marks is in the next three sections. And those are the foundation of theory, the empirical research and the research gap. Now, it's worth mentioning that yeah, we've laid these out as three distinct sections. And in reality, this might not be the case for you. These aren't set in stone. So you might blend these components all together into one body section, or your university might require that things are ordered slightly differently, or that, for example, the foundation of theory or the theoretical framework is its own chapter. So just keep these things in mind. Nevertheless, what is useful to understand at this point is that the first two should feed into the last. And what I mean by that is that the foundation of theory and the empirical research should provide a narrative that helps the research gap, the third piece, 
emerge naturally. So what you want to be doing throughout those first two sections is highlighting where the little gaps exist, where the body of knowledge is somewhat lacking, and then that will then culminate into the research gap. What you don't want is a literature review that rambles on forever and ever and ever. And then when you get to the research gap, it doesn't make sense where these gaps emerged from. You want to be giving little clues, little, little teasers throughout the first two sections that lay a foundation for the research gap. So I won't go into more detail about that. Yeah, we've got plenty of content on the blog, but that's just something to keep in mind. So let's move to the first section, which is the foundation of theory, or also known as the theoretical framework. So the foundation of theory, as the name suggests, is where you lay some foundation for your whole study. So this is where you want to present any important concepts, any definitions, any propositions that are going to be foundational to your research. You want to outline to the reader what you're going to be building onto. So as we always say, Greg Coach, good research is built on the shoulders of giants. This is where you want to lay some of that content out. You want to be discussing what you mean by certain concepts, whose core theories are underpinning your work. And so as an example, if your research aims involved understanding what factors contributed towards people trusting investment brokers, and we'll dig into this a bit more with the actual sample literature review that I'll show you a bit later, then you'd first need to lay down some theory to make it really clear what you mean by this. So you need to explain what do you mean by trust? What do you mean by trusting investment brokers? You know, there's many ways that you conceptualize that. And you'd also need to lay down any core theories that would be relevant to this. And so this is where you lay the groundwork. This is where you provide a basic lay of the land so that you can build onto it with your own research. One thing that's worth pointing out here is that a theoretical framework is typically presented in written form. And what tends to happen is that students get the theoretical framework and the conceptual framework a little bit mixed up. The theoretical framework is a text-based discussion, typically. It doesn't mean you can't have visuals, but it's fundamentally a text-based discussion, whereas the conceptual framework is a visual diagram visualizing the relationships between concepts and variables. So we do have a lot more content about that on the blog, and we'll include the links below there, but it's it's important to remember that in this section, we're talking about the foundation of theory, the theoretical framework, not the conceptual framework. Right, from there, we move on to the empirical research. By empirical research, what I'm referring to is studies that have undertaken actual field work, data collection and data analysis and drawn their conclusions from that, as opposed to purely theoretical work, which you would have discussed in the previous section, obviously. So as an example, if you're investigating the factors that impact a consumer's likelihood to purchase from an e-commerce store, you would then in this section go and review all the studies, all the relevant studies that have undertaken, let's say, qualitative or quantitative research to identify those potential factors. So you'd be highlighting all of the studies. What have they found? What did they investigate? What were they looking for? What methodologies did they use? What are the potential weaknesses of those? And you want to be highlighting all of that empirical research. What's important here is that you focus on synthesizing the information as opposed to just providing a he said, she said type of account. You need to bring it all together into a sort of cohesive narrative that summarizes the current state of knowledge and highlights where the gaps are. So as I mentioned earlier, the research gap, that final section of the the body of your literature review that needs to bubble up it needs to emerge from the preceding sections especially when you speak about the empirical research you don't want to be just detailing this person found this this person found that that is important but what you really want to be doing is synthesizing everything together to say okay well it seems that the results are still somewhat contested in this space. It seems that there's some disagreement in this space. It seems that no one's looked at this space. You want to be having that sort of discussion so that you are giving birth to a set of emergent research gaps. Now, 
from a practical perspective, how you structure this section will vary from study to study. You might, for example, structure it in a thematic basis, and that's the most common. So you would then be grouping your discussion according to concepts or variables or perhaps research aims or research questions. Or you might do it in a different way altogether. You might do it chronologically if your research aims are looking at sort of the evolution of knowledge around a certain topic. Alternatively, you might do it methodologically if your research aims are interested in understanding how a study could be approached better from a methodological perspective. So there are different ways to skin things. Yeah, and we do discuss these options in more detail on the Grad Coach blog. But the important thing to remember is that there's no one way. So what you don't want to be doing is looking at someone else's literature review and going, OK, well, they structured it this way, therefore I need to do it. What you want to do is be context sensitive to your specific situation. Of course, you can and you should draw inspiration by looking at other studies and seeing how they handled things. But don't feel the need to copy anyone or follow any specific format. You need to do what makes sense in the context of your specific study. From there, we'll move on to the research gap. And as I've already said, I'm sounding like a stuck record. This research gap shouldn't just come out of nowhere. It should essentially be a reinforcement and a, a certification of the little crumbs and the clues that you've been dropping throughout your discussion of the theoretical and empirical research so far. So in this section, you want to be explicit. You want to explicitly state that, OK, well, you know, based on a review of the existing re relevant re literature, this is where the research gaps lie. Now, in terms of research gaps, there's there's a lot to be said here, yeah? and we've got plenty of content on the Grad Coach blog, and we've got great videos covering the different types of research gaps and how to find a research gap. So I'm not going to get into tremendous detail in this video. What I will say is have a look at those resources, and of course, if you have any questions, just leave a comment below. Then one other thing that we've included here is a section called other potential inclusions. Now, this isn't part of the five part structure, but it's just a way of us saying, hey, keep these other things in mind, because as I said, universities will vary in terms of what's expected. And certainly within degree programs, there might be standards and norms that would need to be baked into your literature review. So these aren't a certainty, but they're just things to keep in mind. You might need to include hypotheses or propositions that you are proposing as a result of what you've read. You might want to include a conceptual framework. And remember, a conceptual framework is different from a theoretical framework, and we've got a blog post on that, and you can find the link in the description. And you might also have some more discussion about the methodologies and the limitations of the methodologies of previous discussions. So these are just three other potential inclusions. It's certainly not a comprehensive list, but do keep in mind that you might need to bake some other things into the body of your literature review before wrapping up. And so that brings us to the actual wrap up to the conclusion section. And the conclusion section is just a way of tying together everything that you've covered and transitioning to the next chapter. So this is not a lengthy section. All you want to do is quickly recap on what you've covered and what the key insights were. And you want to then transition over to the next chapter. This is usually a, 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 a paragraph or two maximum. So that is the literature review chapter uh, or rather the literature review template. And as I say, you can get access to all of that on the Grad Coach blog, all completely free. Right, so now that we've looked at the literature review template, let's look at an actual literature review chapter from a dissertation. Now, of course, this literature review chapter doesn't follow the template 100% because, as I mentioned, every university has its nuances. Nevertheless, it still has all the core components, and so you can see how this all comes to life. So this literature review is part of a master's level dissertation. It was for an MBA project specifically. And the research aims involved identifying factors that influenced whether a customer was inclined to trust an investment broker, in the specific case, a CFD broker. You don't need to understand the technicalities, but fundamentally what's useful to understand is this research was all about figuring out what makes people trust investment brokers. So naturally, trust is very important in that context because they're dealing with people's money. So let's have a look at it. So right up in the beginning, this is the start of the chapter. And so this very first section is what we would have considered the intro or the introduction 
in the literature review template that we looked at. Notably, it doesn't have a label as an introduction, but nevertheless, the content that kicks off the chapter can be considered the introduction. And so you can see the discussion here is just giving an overview of what will be covered in the chapter and also providing a bit of a overview of the structure of what the chapter will look like. And a useful thing to do that you can see has been done here is to use a visual to make things a little bit more visually appealing, a little bit more interesting. And this is particularly useful. I always recommend it to students in the literature review chapter because the literature review chapter is so text heavy because it does feel like a, a boring wall of text to labor through. It's nice to include some visuals where it makes sense to where they actually add value. And yeah, you can see also a quote was included. And this is again, this is just a, a matter of style and taste, but it is something that you might consider doing in your literature review to give it a little bit of a spice. So from the introduction, we then move on to a section here called conceptualizing and defining organizational trust. And this is essentially a discussion of the foundation of theory or the theoretical framework. You can see this goes on for quite a while, speaking about the different lenses through which a trust can be viewed. You can view it from a psychological perspective, from a sociological perspective, an economic perspective, and so on. You can see, again, using visuals here to make things a little bit more interesting as opposed to just having a wall of text. Same thing, yeah, yeah, we're just talking about the sort of flow of beliefs to attitudes to intentions and ultimately behaviors. Because there's a flow, it again makes for a great use uh, of visuals. Continuing, laying down further foundations. Yeah, all we're doing is conceptualizing what exactly is trust and where is trust applicable? Yeah, we're talking about the trust combinations. So the different types of trust between different entities, between people and organizations, between people and people. And so this is again, just laying a clear foundation to say, okay, cool. You're interested in researching trust. What exactly do you mean by trust? And how, how does the academic world actually conceptualize trust? and so on. It continues, it continues. And what it then culminates in is defining trust for the purpose of this specific project. And this is very important because if we're asking, well, what are the factors that contribute towards trust? We need to know, well, what is trust? What are we actually optimizing for? What is a successful outcome? And so again, based on everything that was discussed in the foundation of theory, trust is then defined very clearly using a definition that's adopted from a seminal piece of work, uh, specifically Mayer et al, 1995. And again, a visual year. And this visual is particularly useful because it links all the little bits and pieces that we've spoken about earlier in the document, links all of them through to the specific one-liner definition of trust. And so again, you can see visuals are a great way to just connect the dots for the reader, make things simpler. You know, a a dissertation is never a simple thing to read. And so what you want to do if you want to get the, the, the goodwill of your marker and your assessor, you want to make it as easy as possible for them, make their job easy. So we've defined trust. And what this then goes on to do is to say, okay, cool, all these theoretical definitions of trust, what might this look like in the context of this specific study? So in the context of trust in investment brokers or CFD brokers. So applying the theoretical foundation to this specific study. Uh, then continues to speak about distrust. So just to provide something to contrast trust against. And if we're defining trust, what do we define distrust as? And also just provide some scoping, uh, making a distinction between initial and ongoing trust. So in other words, uh, what are the factors that influence initial trust versus what are the factors that make people continue to trust a organization? And so that marks the end of a theoretical framework, theoretical foundation. And then we move on to the next section called trust antecedents. And this is just a fancy way of saying the factors that impact people's trust. And what is happening here as we switch to this section is that we're now moving into the empirical research. So we're saying, okay, we've defined 
trust, which in this case is our uh, dependent variable. It's the thing that is affected. Now let's look at what are the things that affect trust, which is the, the focus of the study. And the way that we're going to look at that is we're going to look at what the empirical research has determined so far. So how this section is structured is to group all of these antecedents, these trust antecedents, into similar themes. So you can see yeah, this the first one is the truster's propensity to trust. So in other words, just how in general, how trusting is the person naturally, that's a factor. So that's factor number one, and all of the literature, all of the empirical research is grouped into this little discussion. Yeah. And then what you'll see from that discussion of the empirical research, a hypothesis is generated labeled H1. And in this particular literature review, the hypotheses are generated as a culmination of each of the factors that are discussed in the theory. This may not be the case for every literature review. It might be the case that university expects the hypotheses to only be generated perhaps at the end of the literature review chapter or in the next chapter being the methodology chapter. But nevertheless, this is how it's laid out. Yeah, and so it's useful to see how there is some variation. So then we've discussed one item that potentially contributes towards trust and then on to the next one. So the institution based trust. And so some discussion about the empirical research, what what does the empirical research have to say about this and gen generation of a hypothesis same thing continues throughout the literature review speaking about all the potential factors that are contributing towards trust or contributing towards distrust and then generating a hypothesis on the back of each of those so i'm not going to go into each of them because it's much the same it's just talking about different variables but what you can see here is that there's a lot of use of visuals to bring the concepts to life to make things a little bit more engaging and so on and so forth. So that wraps up the what we'd call the empirical research within the context of the template that we discussed. And then it moves on to a section called literature context gaps and weaknesses. So the key word here is gaps. What that should trigger for you is research gaps from the literature review template. And what this is, is just a brief one or two pager using some visuals highlighting what the context of all these studies were and what that means in terms of gaps and potential weaknesses. So you can see here, the first thing that's brought up is the context of all of these studies. And you can see that there's naturally a, a very Western focus. Yeah, US, UK, Canada, these being the largest portion of the studies that were undertaken. And so what that means is, well, all the studies, or most of the studies were done abroad and they're not necessarily where a gap exists is in other countries. So this study specifically was done in South Africa. And so we can see here that, oh, well, there's 24 studies for the US, but there's only one study for South Africa. And these are distinctly different countries, different socio-demographic mixes. And so what that means is there's a, a good potential for a research gap. There's a good basis on which to say, well, you know, we could do with a bit more research within the South African context. Similarly, they speak about the fact that the majority of these studies were in e-commerce, banking, and financial advisory context, while none of them were specifically addressing trust within the CFD broker industry which is the focus of this research and so on and so forth. And what is going on here is a basic argument saying, well, you know, within our specific context, within the South African CFD brokerage context, there isn't really literature that relates to this. And therefore, there's a research gap. One final thing that is spoken about here is the methodological approaches of each of these studies. And what you can see here is that the majority of them, 72% of them were quantitative, 15% were qualitative, and the balance were either mixed or unknown. Now, there's two ways you can look at this. One is you can say, well, Gee, there's been a lot of quantitative research, not a lot of qualitative research, not a lot of mixed methods research. So maybe that's where the opportunity lies is that there's, there's room for greater qualitative and mixed method based insight. The other argument that you can make is, well, it seems fairly established that when you're researching the antecedents, the factors that contribute towards trust, a quantitative approach really makes sense. So you can spin that one of two ways. And that's just something that's useful to be aware of. So last but not least, we have the chapter summary or conclusion. And you can see this is really, really brief. This is just a paragraph wrapping up 
what's been covered. And it is not particularly specific. It doesn't state what what the findings were. It just sort of reiterates on the process that was, was adopted. Then in the final line, it actually says something quite interesting, which says, in the next chapter, the hypotheses will be amalgamated into a theoretical framework. This is an error because it should say conceptual framework. But what is useful to understand here is that this is a great transition saying that yeah, in this chapter, we develop the hypotheses and in the next chapter, these hypotheses will be formed into a conceptual framework, which will then be tested with the actual study. So this is just useful to highlight that this summary does more than just summarizes, it transitions into the next chapter, which is always a great practice to adopt in your study. So as you can see in this example of a literature review, the exact shape and the exact terminology that will be used in a literature review chapter will vary from institution to institution, but the fundamentals remain the same in that there's still a generic five part structure or at least five ingredients that need to go into the literature review nevertheless. So be sure to always check very, very closely any briefing documents, any templates, any samples, and ideally some past dissertations or theses so that you have a clear idea of what the norms are within your institution. All right, so that brings us to the end of this video. If you want to learn more about how to write a winning literature review, be sure to check out our popular online course, Literature Review Bootcamp. You can find a discounted offer to that in the description below. Alternatively, if you're looking for hands-on help with your literature review or any aspect of your dissertation thesis or research project, be sure to check out our private coaching service where we hold your hand through the entire research journey step by step. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can book a free consultation over at gradcoach.com. Until next time, good luck.